the name of God who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen. During my time in Los Angeles, I had the extraordinary privilege of attending a meeting of religious leaders of different faith traditions at the home of Rabbi Mark Diamond, who was at that time the Los Angeles Regional Director of the American Jewish Committee. It was in October, and the Jewish people were celebrating Sukkot, so we learned about the Jewish Harvest Festival of Sukkot as we sat outside in the sukkah, an open patio covered with bamboo shoots or other natural material. But it was the special guest at our meeting who left a deep impression on me. Our special guest was Dr. Judea Pearl, father of the late Daniel Pearl. You may remember that Daniel Pearl was the Wall Street journalist who was brutally murdered by terrorists in Pakistan in February of 2002. What was so incredibly remarkable to me was the grace and genuine goodwill with which Dr. Pearl shared the story of the Daniel Pearl Foundation. Dr. Pearl, his wife Ruth, and their whole family had taken their grief over Daniel's murder and, surely with God's help, transformed it not into vengeance or calls to bring the terrorists to justice. They took the energy of their deep grief and focused it into creating a foundation that would honor Daniel's memory by promoting tolerance and understanding through education and communication. That's a direct quote from the mission statement. What was so very clear to me was that it was Dr. Pearl's deep and abiding Jewish faith that had allowed and supported such a transformation. Chapter 11 of the Epistle to the Hebrews, the most familiar chapter in the book, is about faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. If we are serious about our own faith, at some point in our lives we will inevitably have to deal with the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Whether we confront a personal crisis or a massive social catastrophe, we will have to face the reality of the fact that innocent people die in tragedies not of their own making, while some who willfully participate in evil survive and even thrive. Some people who smoke and drink heavily live to be 100, while younger people who never put a cigarette to their lips die of lung cancer in their 40s. You all know what I'm talking about. At some point, or maybe points in our lives, we stop and cry out to God, that's not fair. What the heck are you doing? Can't you see what's happening down here? And of course, God does know. God doesn't need us to tell God what's going on. It breaks God's own heart to see much of it. And as Christians, when we respond to the question, where is God in all of this, the first thing we could say is, God is on the cross. God was with Daniel Pearl 
and the victims of the terrorist attacks of September 11th. God was with the victims of the Orlando shootings, the violence throughout this past July and other crises, whether natural disasters or human-made crises. God is also with those who mourn and weep and grieve. God empowers the rescuers, the investigators, and all people engaged in battles against evil and sin. God probably weeps most of all over the tragic and unbelievable reality that any human beings should cause such death and destruction. What a blow to our loving God who gave each and every one of us the gift of life including God's own life, to have it be destroyed by unstable, treacherous humanity. Why does God seem to allow bad things to happen to good people? In my experience, there is no completely satisfactory answer to this timeless question. But there is a response we can make. As Christians, our response is faith. Whatever we call it, faith is not always an easy thing to talk about, much less defend in the light of immense tragedy and despair. For one thing, we recognize faith in part as a gift from God. We observe that to some people, faith comes easily, while to others of us, it can be painfully elusive. To talk about faith requires grappling with the facts. One cannot talk about faith as if death were not an issue. One cannot speak as if despair has been completely vanquished. One cannot speak as if addiction has been completely overcome or hopelessness alleviated worldwide. In another part of Luke's Gospel, the Apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. Faith requires us to experience the realities of life, the boundaries of humanness, the limitations of the spirit. Faith asks that we face the facts as they are and then hear the question, is God present here at all? It is a confrontation with reality not unlike that experienced by Ezekiel when the Spirit of God took him to a valley of dry bones. In that valley that symbolizes death, Failed dreams, dashed hopes, and defeat, the question of faith finds its context. God asks the prophet, can these bones live? What is faith? When one looks the word up in a dictionary, one comes across the following definitions. Confidence or trust in a person or thing. Belief, which is not based on proof. Belief in doctrines or teachings of religion. The word belief, or what one believes, might be suitable synonyms for faith. The thing that seems interesting to me is that since one of the definitions is belief which is not based on proof, we sometimes come to the conclusion that faith has nothing to do with our intellect or reasoning power. We need to check our brains at the door of faith, so to speak. Nothing could be further from the truth, however. One has to use reason to overcome the obstacles posed by reason. Faith calls upon every aspect of ourselves, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual, to participate fully in the lives of faith to which God in Christ calls us. 
The real issue here, it seems to me, lies in recognizing the difference between proof and evidence. And beyond that, understanding that it is usually not proof we desire with respect to what we believe or our faith. Theologian and writer Frederick Beekner helps with this distinction. We can prove that the world is round, or that two plus two equals four, or that the television works, or if we are very clever, that light travels faster than sound. But how do you prove the friendship of a friend? How do you prove the greatness of the great, or the beauty of the beautiful? How do you prove that God exists? The answer is, I can't prove the friendship of my friend. When I experience it, I don't need to prove it. When I don't experience it, no proof will do. And if I tried to put the friendship of my friend to the test somehow, the test itself might damage the friendship. And what about proving the existence of God? Henry Mitchell, preacher and author, tells about a friend of his who once put him up against the friend's self-possessed atheistic boss. Apparently, the boss frequently needled Henry's friend about his faith, so the friend decided that Henry, being a well-known, well-educated preacher, would know how to argue and win against the otherwise delightful unbeliever. But as Henry Mitchell tells it, his friend was disappointed when Mitchell shook hands with the boss and declined to participate in rational debate. It had to be understood, he said, that such debate could be meaningful only on the basis of shared premises. The boss said, God is not, while Henry said, God is. So the match was off. However, Mitchell reminded his erstwhile opponent that both premises were matters of faith, since neither of them might have what we might call hard data. And then Henry began to share 25 years of experience in what he called the laboratory of life, offering evidence that one could be quite rational and trusting at the same time. His friend's boss was fascinated, and when it came to be his turn to testify as to how his experience supported his thesis that God is not, he hesitated. After a long silence, Mitchell casually asked him what God had done to cause him to write God off. He answered almost eagerly, God had let his saintly mother die a lingering painful death of cancer. A true God would have never let that happen. Just then, the light dawned. He had just implied intellectual assent to God, even though he didn't trust that God. And the intellectual obstacles began to fade, and the possibility of new ways of relating to this hidden God began to grow. When you really think about it, the most important things in life cannot be proved. But the evidence for faith abounds, first and foremost, in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, in Luke's Gospel, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said to them, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now. I don't want to be too technical here, but there is something terribly important that Jesus says to his disciples that one can only comprehend if one looks at the grammatical structure in Greek. Hang with me. 
The Greek language has two types of if clause. One type of if clause expresses a condition contrary to fact, such as if I were you and I'm not. The other type of if clause expresses a condition according to fact, such as if Jesus is Lord or if Barack Obama is president. And the case is pretty clear that these statements are true. So two types of conditional clauses, if clauses, contrary to fact, in accordance with fact. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I always heard Jesus saying, if only you had faith the size of a mustard seed, and you do not. But the Greek if clause is according to fact. One correctly translates it, if you had faith and you do. In other words, Jesus' response to his disciples' request is not a judgment on an absence of faith, but an indirect affirmation of the faith they already have, even if it's really small, and an invitation to live out to the fullest the possibilities of that faith. Increase our faith, Lord, we say. And Jesus says, even the small amount of faith you have, you already have, is effective and powerful beyond your present realization. It's like asking your hostess for more potatoes when you still have potatoes on your plate. Characteristically, Jesus goes one step further in his response with the deliberately exaggerated example of uprooting a tree and having it planted in the sea. What Jesus is saying is that the possibilities opened up by faith cancel out such words as impossible or absurd. The relatively small amount of faith the apostles already have is enough to put them in touch with the unlimited power of God. Jesus himself had unlimited trust in the power of God and frequently made extravagant promises to demonstrate that. Finally, yet not so finally, there will always be times in our lives when we feel like Ezekiel standing in the middle of a desert of dry and lifeless bones. Everything is dead. Or like ourselves, pondering the senseless murder of Daniel Pearl or the evil and destruction of the World Trade Center or the recent shootings in Orlando. We may feel we have lost what little faith we had, or that everything is dead and pointless. We may question whether God is all that good, or perhaps even whether there really is a God. We may simply feel the utter pain of despair. I ask you today, if you ever find yourself in a situation such as I've described, to remember the words of the Spirit of God to the prophet Ezekiel, standing in the middle of desolation. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. Faith recognizes the realities of our time, but does not accept them as final. Death is real, but it is not the end of the story. Pain is abundant, but it is not eternal. Despair is profound, but it is not the wisdom of God. Injustice may seem on the rise, but in the end, it will not reign. Each of us already has at least a mustard seed of faith. It is now ours to live that faith and nurture the seeds to their fullest possible growth in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.